Welcome, you're listening to the Leading Hope Podcast. My name is VJ Williams here with my friend and pastor, Kevin Jack. Thank you for joining us, taking time out of your day to become a better leader. If you're new, we release a new episode release. every Wednesday. We would love for you to uh, just download that on your favorite podcast platform. Also, share this with a friend, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, and rate and review on Apple Podcasts. You won't believe how that helps get this podcast in the hands of all our friends who are trying to get better, uh, like we're trying to get better every week. And uh, visit leadinghope.online uh, to get updates and find out more about the Leading Hope podcast and community. Today uh, is a new series. New series. You've uh, titled the series All Things Change. Today is episode 172, Everything Can Change. 172, Everything, Everything. Can Change. Everything. Yeah, so we're jumping into uh, a three-part series. And this series is going to be a little exhaustive on all things change. And just to kind of really look at like, hey, as we're talking the leadership work of change management, of change leadership, honestly, this is really a here's here's every side of it. Instead of just typically when we do series, we kind of zero in and lock in and just go, hey, look at look at this. This yep. is we want to give you more of a comprehensive look of what change management really looks like. Yeah. So um, so if I could just give a couple notes at the beginning in terms of where we're headed, that just real simply change is the planned transition from where we are to where we need to be. Or I would clarify change leadership is the planned transition. I mean, if there's no planned transition, I mean, it could still happen. It just, it's, you're just lucky if it worked out yeah. well. Blessed. Yeah, blessed. There you go. <laughs> I'll say lucky. I feel more comfortable with that. And I, here's what I really want people to see throughout this series is the idea that everything can change, but not everything can change equally easy. And that before you set upon an undertaking of change, you need to understand the dynamics that make change difficult or that make change easy. So some simple ideas like there are mental models that are at stake that if people can't think out of one certain frame of thinking, change is going to be even harder. There are values that become embedded in the organization. And some of this is like, oh, that's a great thing. But if the values you have are no longer helpful for where you want to head and violating those are viewed as heresy, that becomes a significant problem. There's processes and behaviors that get hardened over time there's relationships that instead of being formed around mission are now formed around making sure hey are we okay where people can't challenge or confront each other because they're too scared about risking the relationship and all of these factor into the equation of to say hey everything can change you are not ever locked into where you are but not everything can change equally easy so today i want to give some ideas on how everything could change um first off and these are going to be in the show notes i want to give you real quickly the eight dimensions of readiness for change so these are the eight things that if you're about to undertake a process of change that you should be aware of. And the eight dimensions of readiness are trustworthy leadership. Do you have leadership that has a strong track record? Trusting followers, uh, that doesn't automatically go with number one, okay? You can have uh, trustworthy leadership and not have trusting followers, which makes change more difficult. Third one, capable champions, people within the organization who can champion change. Fourth is involved middle, middle management, that there's people throughout the process who want to be engaged in what needs to take place. Otherwise, there'll be an obstacle. The fifth one is an innovative culture. Is your culture a culture that likes change, that prides itself on being cutting edge and wanting to change? Or do they find their identity more in being traditional and being the same year after year? Six, an accountable culture, a culture that actually calls people out when they're not adopting the behaviors that they need to adopt. Seventh is effective communication and eighth is systems thinking. And so just to say like, hey, as you're looking through that, and again, those are in the show notes, I'm not going to go through it again. These are kind of eight dimensions to be aware of because typically, and I've been in these rooms where to go, hey, we're going to change this. Yeah, I think that'll work. And I would just say, Why? Have you fully thought through the factors? Uh, an interesting exercise that you could do, it's called a force field analysis, which I know sounds like really Star Wars-y, something like that. Like, yep. Yeah, there we go. 
Geeks love it. Yep. <laughs> uh, but it's to literally map it out and to draw contrasting arrows against each other and to say, hey, we have trustworthy leadership working for us. We do not have an accountable culture working for us. And as you go through these different pieces, as you kind of diagram out, map out the change you're seeking to undertake, it really helps you understand like, hey, this is the obstacles we can anticipate. And these are the things that we can build on. And so just to think through, those are the eight factors as you're thinking through readying an organization for change. Now, here's how to ready an organization for change. And have you, VJ, did you ever play with a uh, silly putty? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Fan. Did you ever have it where you, uh, where you left the lid open and it was just like, it's just sitting on your dresser or something like that for a couple of days. Yep. And you go to pick it up and it was like. It's a rock. Yeah. Almost like the consistency of that, uh, like circus peanut candy, yep. which people eat as well. Yep. So I would say like, this is what it means readying your organization. And did you know the trick for how you make it, how you make it good again? I probably did at the time. I don't remember. You just add a little water to it. Oh, that's yeah, it. That's it. Sounds just a little like water. It. Yeah. Work it throughout. Good old moldable silly putty all over again. There you go. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> so if your organization is like that silly putty that has been left out and it's a rock, there is a way to make it softer. There are ways to make it more ready for change. I want to give you three real quick. First one is create a crisis. <laughs> have something and you don't have to wait for a crisis. Like there are crises that come like COVID was a massive crisis that caused all organizations to change whether they oh. wanted to or not. There are ways to, whether it's creating urgency around a goal, could be financial crisis that's the, there. It could be staff realignment, things like that. All of these create within the organization a sense of like, hey, things are shifting. Instead of trying to change a behavior when it's rock solid, that's like adding water to the silly putty, okay? Create a crisis. A second way is to develop a vision that creates dissatisfaction with the status quo. This is my favorite thing just to be clear, is to say that the crisis, uh, give or take, sometimes I feel it feels a little icky to go, hey, let's make it, make it a crisis. I, I far more want to say like, hey, instead of disrupting what is, I'd rather us look further out on where we could be in the near future and where we want to be. And all of a sudden that helps us look at things that are currently taking place and just to go, no, this, this doesn't work. Uh, we were in a meeting this morning and the conversation was having a vision automatically sets the pace for our organization. Yeah. Like that's not our decision any longer. We have to go, Hey, to do this, we have to be running at this pace and getting these things done. And it automatically filters out things that aren't working. Yep. Instead of going, Oh, it's fine. Do we want to change it? We go, no, we, we don't have an option. Yeah if we're gonna do this. So creating a crisis, developing a vision that creates dissatisfaction. And then a third idea is finding a champion of change who will build awareness of the need for change and articulate the vision. What we mean is this, is you find someone other than the leader who begins to champion, this is what needs to take place. And honestly, at its best, you're, you're figuring out a way to make all three of these work in tandem. You're finding a way to go, how do we create the crisis, establish the vision, and finding champions of change within the organization? Now, you may not have all three available to you at once, but I, but I just want to say, hey, if your organization, if you don't have trusting leadership, trusting followers, if you don't have an innovative culture working for you, and you go, hey, we're going to do this differently, it's not going to go well, <laughs> okay? It's not going to work. So that's how you ready an organization for change. And then third thing I wanna look at today is we're kinda of throughout this series taking this more robust look at change management. And that is just the simplest way to understand the process of change. And for most people, this is what we think it is, is we think if I get people to see the data, automatically they'll begin thinking differently and then they'll change. <laughs> If they could just see the facts, then it'll change how they view the situation and then the change will occur. And so it's really this sequence of data, think different, behavior change. And it, my guess is many people even hearing this today are like, well, yeah, yeah, that's how it works. 
But you know that's not how it works. Like, you know, there's this uh, great fable uh, that I absolutely love, and it's called The Elephant and the Rider. And it says that there are two parts of your brain. There's the logical side, and there is the emotional side. The logical, rational side is the rider. The emotional side is the elephant. And if you riding the elephant are going to get to where you want to go, you need the rider to help guide the elephant. But the elephant is really the power behind the process. And, and here's the key to it is you need to figure out how to get the logical part of people's brains and the emotional part of people's brains working in tandem. Because if the rational side says this is what we should do, but the emotional side says absolutely not, the emotional side wins out every single time. Case in point, how many times have you set out upon a workout plan or a new diet or a new sleep schedule or a new way of learning or I'm gonna read this many books or any one of these other things? Your, your mental part of you, your rational side said, this is good, but your emotional side said, I don't want to do it. <laughs> And the emotional side always wins out. And so as we think through behavioral change, we need to abandon this concept of better data, think different, change automatically occurs. Because the more likely reality of how change works is people need to see something different, feel something different, and then change. Again, it's not data, think different, change. It's see, feel, change. And if you neglect that feel part of the change, every single one of your desires, every one of your change initiatives, I promise you are going to fall flat. That most of the reason we don't change is because of deeply held emotion, not logic. So if we're going to create change, we must operate the same way. V, what do you want to jump into? Uh, let's start right there at the very end there. You said uh, see, feel. Do you have any examples of, I think people can get the C thing. I mean, uh, you know, we've quoted it quite a few times. Sometimes you have to see somebody do something before you love it for yourself. Yep. Love um, it. Right. Like we know that. I mean, that's pretty ingrained in some of the things that we talk about as leaders yeah. anyway. But the feel one, I think, is a more harder one to describe for the individual that might be watching today. Can you give us an example of what yeah. that might be? Because I, oh, think, yeah, yeah. I think that's the how how you feel or how you know i mean seeing is seeing I, I, you can interpret that but you still saw it happen yep what's the feel part yeah uh, if i could go back uh, um an example i would give is uh years ago uh when i was helping transition a church that did not go great it went well some great things came of it but it did not go great i was uh, i was meeting with this uh older woman in the church who had been a part of the church for 40 years and I uh, had breakfast with her every week and I sat down with her just to try to explain why we were doing the different things that we were doing. Here's why we were switching the music. Yeah. Here's how, why we were switching groups. And I was like, and I was, honestly, I was doing a bunch of research. Like I was going through scripture. I was, I was making arguments for the different pieces. We sat down and I'd show her like, she was a strong, like I would say like, strong Baptist Bible believer. Like, yeah. this is what it says. This is what we do. And I would take her through all these pieces. And at the end of six months of meeting with her, uh, she's basically said, well, I see what you're saying. I just don't agree with it. Yeah. Which was so baffling to me. Cause I was like, if you believe this is true and I've shown you where this says this, I don't know how you couldn't agree with this. And, and now that I understand to go so much of the change part is emotional, what I wish I would have done is I wish I would have told her stories every week of people's lives who were being transformed. That's good. And I wish I would have introduced her to the people and had different people tell her the impact that the changes in the church were having on their life. That's really good. And I just, I just completely neglected the emotional side and assumed that the logical piece would be enough. That's really good. Uh, it brings me to a... Uh, you know, parenting, 
Yeah. It's like sometimes you can tell your the same kid thing over and over, but it's that outside yep. influence that can help them feel. I get that. That makes complete sense. Yeah, and it makes you so crazy. Oh, it's like, yeah. I told you that a thousand times. Exactly, and we wonder why. And they said the same thing, but that's that makes complete sense. Uh, the other question I had was, you said uh, sometimes you have to create a crisis. I know a lot of people watching yeah. or hearing that for the first time, maybe you're like, ooh, that sounds mm -hmm. deviant. Or, yeah. um, you know, maybe not the greatest way to conduct yourself. Whatever, yeah. However we want to feel about it. Feel about it. Yep. See there? See what we did there? Um, <laughs> what, do, what, what are some examples? Cause, uh, oh, that's great. I, I know people want to know specifically what kind of crisis can they create that won't yeah. destroy their organization, but yeah. actually get them to the next level to so create So if change. we could say that, like, don't pull the fire alarm. Yeah. Like, that's not what we mean. Gotcha. Don't create a false sense of emergency that isn't actually there. Because that's just manipulative. Yeah. But, and <laughs> if we could, like, just live in the epitome of water cooler talk right here, is to say, like, change a process. Yeah. And everybody loses their minds. Yeah. Uh, switch people's offices. Yeah, that's great. Like, there, there are a thousand ways to disrupt the status quo that all of a sudden gets people's attention. Yeah. And just say like, we we always default to mindless routine. Every single person does. We default to mindless routine. And so if you're gonna change anything that, that matters, first you have to disrupt that mindless routine to create an atmosphere good. where people have a heightened sense of awareness. That's really good. Uh, we've seen that before with uh, work schedules and learning how to actually lead teams, right? Yep. By adding adding the right amount of weight to someone's plate so that they no longer can do it by themselves because they need to lead people instead yep. in the same concept. If, if I can put it like yeah. real, like, I don't think, I don't want when people hear crisis for them to think big. Yeah. Because the reality is anything that's in a disruption in people's heads feels like a crisis. So if you're going to like share information with your team about something that really needs to change... Maybe you meet in a different environment at a different time. Yeah, that's good. You're doing anything you can to disrupt that. Cool, man. Last question, um, and then you can you know give us the rundown on this. Uh, the lady that you mentioned. Yep. How's that going today? Do you still talk to her? Do you know her? Is she? Did how did that all end? Um, uh, <laughs> well, it, it's actually kind of a sad story. Oh like, no. She stayed where she was, and the church slowly declined over. The years because they never changed anything. Got it. And so that's the that's the that's the bad part of not not change manager. Yeah, and I don't know, like not. I feel there's a part of me that goes, I feel really bad about that. That I because I had a significant role in that, and part of me feels bad that I didn't know what I know now that's to say. Obviously, she has a choice to listen or not. Of course, but to say, man, your response is really different between data and stories. Yeah. Your response is really different between an argument and a testimony. Yeah. And I wish I could have shared that other side with her. That's I think that's what this podcast is all about though. Yes. It's learning, right? To get better. Yep. Uh, and now we know what we know. And hopefully we're saving someone else from having breakfast for six months that <laughs> bore no fruit. Yeah, that's great. Bore no impact. Wrap this up, 172. Everything can change. Yeah, I, wanna, I just want to come back to that statement that we shared at the very beginning. Everything can change, but not everything can change equally easy. And so before you set out on an undertaking of change, you need to understand the dynamics that make change easy or difficult. So that's what we tried to walk through just as an initial piece on this everything can change series is the idea like, hey, here's the eight dimensions of change. Here's what you can do to ready an organization for change. But when you enact change, you need to prioritize emotion and feeling and not simply data and logic. That's awesome. Thank you guys for joining us today. Make sure you come back next week as we continue the series on all things change. If you're new to the podcast or haven't yet subscribed, it mean the world to us if you did that now. Also post about it, rate and review or both. You won't believe how that helps get this podcast in the hands of so many more leaders like you trying to get better like us. And we love hearing your stories of how the podcast is working in your life and business. If you have a story, visit leadinghope.online. Send that to us. We would love to hear from you. And remember, everyone has 20 minutes to learn to become a better leader. Make it count.